Choose the number 2 and take its square root. This gives you a smaller number. Take the square root again and it gets even smaller. If you keep taking the square root, it gets smaller and smaller but still stays above 1. If you take the square root an infinite number of times, you'll actually get the number 1. Let's try the same thing again, this time with the number 1 half. If you take its square root, it gets larger. And if we take it again, it gets closer to 1. If we take the square root an infinite number of times, again, we get the number 1. What we're noticing here is a very interesting pattern of the square root function. Let's graph it to see what's really happening. In red, I have drawn the graph of the square root function for positive numbers. Now, at each point, I will draw a purple arrow. These arrows will point to the direction that that point goes after applying the square root. All these arrows are pointing to a specific point on the graph. That point is 1, 1. Now we will animate the motion of these arrows under the square root function. You'll see that once we apply the function, all the arrows appear to flow into the point 1, 1. Notice how the point 1, 1 does not move throughout this whole process. That's actually because the point 1 is what's called a fixed point of our square root function. A fixed point of any function is a point x such that f of x is equal to x. In other words, it's a point where applying the function f does nothing to it. Because the square root of 1 is equal to 1, we know that 1 is a fixed point of the square root function. One way to visualize this is to see where the graph of your function intersects the line y equals x. This is because any point on this line has the added condition that f of x will equal x. What we've just seen is that if you keep taking the square root of any number, you will eventually get the fixed point of the square root function. In fact, this is not unique to the square root function. There's a special class of functions, like cosine of x, or e to the negative x squared, where if you keep applying them to any point, you will always end up with the fixed point of those functions. There's actually a theorem about this pattern, and it's called the Banach Fixed Point Theorem, named after the Polish mathematician Banach. What I'd like to do in the rest of this video is state the theorem and break down exactly what it means. Then, I'll cover a proof of the theorem in detail. The theorem goes like this. In a complete space x, every contraction from x to x has a fixed point p that you can get by repeatedly applying the function f to any point in the space. If you don't know what any of these words mean, don't worry, I'll cover that all in a minute. But first, let's gain some intuition about what this theorem is saying. The blue circle here will represent the complete space x. Intuitively, you can think of a complete space as some sort of geometric object which has no holes in it. You can think of a contraction as some sort of shrinking function on the space x. What this theorem says is that if you keep contracting the space, you will eventually shrink down to a point. And this point will be a fixed point of the contraction function. Let's see how this applies to our square root function from before. Applying the square root function to every point on the curve shows us that this curve eventually shrinks in to the fixed point of the function. Let's now break down what all those words in the theorem mean. We first start by answering the question, what is a contraction? A contraction is simply a function from x to x. This means that f sends points in x to other points also in x. For the function to be a contraction, it also needs to satisfy an additional requirement. This requirement is that for every pair of points, x and y, we have this inequality. The distance between f of x and f of y is less than q, times the distance between x and y. Here, q is some scaling factor that is a number between 0 and 1. This is a mouthful and probably doesn't make a lot of sense at first, so let's break down what it means. To denote the distance between two points, I use the notation d of x, y. This simply means the distance between the points x and y. 
When I refer to distance, there's a couple different things I could mean. For instance, there's the one-dimensional distance between two points on a line. This corresponds to the length of the line between them. There's also the two-dimensional distance between points on a plane, which is the length of the line segment traveling between them. For the purposes of this video, we'll be focusing on the two-dimensional distance, but anything we do can easily be generalized to any other notion of distance. For those of you interested in the details, this distance is actually what's called a metric, but we won't be covering that in detail here. Now that we got that out of the way, let's break down this inequality. What this is saying is that if you have any two points in your space, call them x and y, and consider the distance between them. Then, if you apply the function to these two points, so you get f of x and f of y, and also consider the distance between them. Then, you have some relationship between these distances. Namely, that the distance after applying the function is less than the distance before applying the function multiplied by some scaling factor q. Remember that this q is in between 0 and 1. You can see that this idea encapsulates the notion of a shrinking function, because the distance between points always gets smaller and closer together. Let's see an example in action. Here is the two-dimensional plane, and the contraction function that we will be considering is the function that takes a point and divides each coordinate by 2. Let's plot some points in the plane and see what happens after we apply the function. You can see that they appear to shrink into the origin of the grid. Let's apply it again and again. You can see that they get closer and closer after repeated applications of the function. The point that they are converging to is the point 0, 0. If we plug this into our function, we can actually see that this is a fixed point of the function. This is related to the statement of our theorem, which says that the repeated application of a contraction always approaches a fixed point. Okay, so we've seen what a contraction is. Now we need to take a look at the rest of the theorem. So we need to ask the question, what is a complete space? A complete space heavily relies on Cauchy sequences. So we first need to ask, what is a Cauchy sequence? A sequence of points is called Cauchy if the distance between the points in the sequence approaches zero. Formally, we can say a sequence is Cauchy if the limit as n approaches infinity of the distance between xn and xn plus 1 is equal to zero. Geometrically, this means that the points in the sequence eventually begin to cluster around each other. Now you may think that every Cauchy sequence appears to converge. Just take the limit to be the point that everything clusters around. But this is actually not the case. Let's see why. Here's an example. We'll take our space to be the set of positive real numbers. That is every point on this line that is greater than zero. Now consider the sequence of points defined by the formula one over n, where n is a natural number. You can see that these points begin to cluster around the origin of the line. If we calculate the limit between the distance of the points, we see that it goes to zero. So this is in fact a Cauchy sequence. However, it does not converge to any point. The limit of the sequence one over n is equal to zero. However, this point zero is not in our space because we defined our points to be everything greater than zero. I know it may seem weird to say that this sequence doesn't converge, but when we define our space, we are saying that the only points that exist are those greater than zero. So how can our sequence converge to a point that literally does not exist in the context of our space? If we change the definition of our space to be everything greater than or equal to zero, then the sequence does converge, this time because zero is actually in our space. What's interesting is that the convergence of a Cauchy sequence is entirely dependent on the space that the sequence lives in, and not the sequence itself. So, we say that a space is complete if every Cauchy sequence converges. A nice way to think about this is that a space is complete if it contains no holes that a sequence can cluster around while avoiding convergence. Here's an example that relates to our theorem. We'll consider the same contraction function as before, that divides each coordinate by 2. 
This time, our space will be the two-dimensional plane minus the origin. Now if we plot some points and see what happens after we apply the function, they do appear to cluster around the origin. However, they do not converge to zero, which would be our fixed point of this function. If we change our space to be complete by including the origin, then the theorem works, because every point will eventually converge to zero, which would be the fixed point. Alright, so we've seen all the components of the theorem. Now it's time to put all these together and prove the Banach fixed point theorem. Let's remind ourselves what it says. In a complete space x, every contraction from x to x has a fixed point p, and you can get this fixed point by repeatedly applying the contraction to any point of the space. For the proof, I'll split the screen in half. On the left side is where we'll do all our work in justification for the theorem. On the right, I'll add nice visuals to help you understand what's going on. On the left, we have written the assumptions of the theorem, that being that x is a complete space and f is a contraction on x. This means that f maps points in x to other points also in x. Because f is a contraction, we know that the distance between the points after applying the function is less than q times the distance before, where q is some scaling factor between 0 and 1. We're going to use this definition of a contraction to show that f has a fixed point p, and we can get this point by repeatedly applying f to any point in the space. Take any point in the space. Call it x1. We're going to define a sequence associated with this point. The next term in the sequence, x2, will be equal to f of x1. The next term, x3, will be what you get when you apply f twice to x1. Continuing this pattern, we get an infinite sequence of points that I will plot on the right of the screen. A recursive definition for this sequence will be xn is equal to f of xn minus 1, which is applying f to the previous point in the sequence. From the picture on the right, these points appear to cluster around each other. So my claim is that this sequence, xn, is a Cauchy sequence. Showing that this is, in fact, a Cauchy sequence will take a little bit of work, but bear with me because it's worth it in the end. We'll start by looking at the distance between the first two points. But there's not much we can see here, so let's look at the distance between the next two points, x3 and x2. We know from the recursive definition of our sequence that this is equal to the distance between f of x2 and f of x1. Now because f is a contraction, we get this inequality, that this is less than q times the distance between x2 and x1. So we have this inequality, that the distance between x3 and x2 is less than q times the distance between x2 and x1. Let's see what we can say about the next two terms, x4 and x3. Using the recursive definition of the sequence and the fact that f is a contraction, we know that this is less than q times the distance between x3 and x2. There's something interesting about the last term in this inequality. Using the inequality directly above it, we can conclude that this is less than q times q times the distance between x2 and x1. Finally, we can chain these relations together to show that the distance between x4 and x3 is less than q squared times the distance between x2 and x1. Continuing this pattern for every pair of consecutive points, we get the relation that the distance between xn plus 1 and xn is less than q to the n minus 1 times the distance between the first two points. Now we can simply take the limit of both sides of this inequality. Because q is in between 0 and 1, multiplying it by itself an infinite number of times will give you 0. Therefore, this limit is equal to 0, and multiplying this limit by anything will also be 0. So the right-hand limit here is equal to 0. Now with a simple squeeze theorem argument, we know that the limit of the distance between two consecutive points goes to zero. Therefore, our sequence is Cauchy. Okay, that's the hard part of the proof done. The rest is easy. Because our sequence is Cauchy and our space is complete, we know that this converges to some point P. All we need to do is show that P is a fixed point of our contraction.
First, we'll rewrite this limit by substituting in the recursive definition for xn. Now, because every contraction is continuous, we can pull this f outside the limit. And lastly, we evaluate the limit inside f to be p. Therefore, f of p is equal to p and is a fixed point of our contraction. So we've proved the theorem. To finish off this video, I'd like to take a look at a really cool application of this theorem. Let's say you want to see what happens when you apply cosine an infinite number of times to any number. Well, we can actually use the Banach fixed point theorem to see what it is. All we need to notice is that cosine is a contraction from the real numbers to the real numbers, which is a complete space. So this infinite expression will be equal to the fixed point of cosine of x. So if we graph it and calculate what the fixed point is, we know that this expression is equal to 0.739. I hope this video has showed you how cool fixed point theorems can be. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like. Thank you for watching.